for science. So uh, our team is working on membrane biogenesis. And I'll just start with a brief introduction to show you where we're at. If, uh, does this work? Yeah, can you see it? So this is Grenoble here. Uh, we're right in the middle of the Alps. And the lab is ne just nested somewhere here. And we're surrounded by hospitals. So it's a, a health uh, hub. Uh, and the lab is uh, located in the Institute uh, for Advanced Bioscience here around the hospital. And this is uh, the team how it was a couple of years ago. So you see that a very large and, and diverse team and has been said this morning for anyone who's looking for opportunities. And I've been chatting with a couple of you already. There's plenty of things going on. And also our students are coming to you. So uh, that's that's a good thing. So uh, as you see, also the team has plenty of, of PhDs and some of the work that I'll be presenting today is their work, first of all. And uh, just to uh, finish about, about the team, some of the, the things that we are doing, I don't know whether that's right, uh, is lipidomics. So we have a facility, a full platform that is also directed by uh, Dr. Yamario Gote, who's also my wife, but more uh, the head technical of the lab. And most of the, the findings presented today has also been developed by her. So if you want to uh, discuss the techniques, do not come to me after the talk, go to her. <laughs> All right. A brief introduction about AP complex at parasites, although most of you know some of you are not really uh, familiar with uh, these organisms. So they are unicellular eukaryotes. And as such, they uh, carry the typical organelles nucleus and the endomembrane system. I'll be talking a lot about it. Uh, and uh, these protists are uh, the causing agent of important and major human diseases. And the two uh, models that we study in the lab are Toxoplasma gondii, responsible for toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is a chronic disease that affects about two thirds of the world population, meaning that here in this room, two person out of three already have the parasites. And as long as your immune system is okay, you're okay, kind of. But if your immune system goes down or if you're pregnant uh, and you've never been in contact with the parasite, then it can become very lethal. I will not talk about uh, much about the other effects, but having the parasite also affects your behavior. And it's not, uh, it's not like a silent parasite, as we like to, to call it. It also changes how you behave. And it shows also how we've been evolving. We're thinking that we're only human and behaving as we are by our own uh, thoughts. But also pathogen, infectious agents are totally part of our own behavior. And as an example, Toxo is capable of making you more prone to taking risk. There is like the, the, the capacity of a female and male being attracted by uh, the other kind being affected by Toxo. Uh, there's plenty of new discoveries about it. I just want to promote a little bit the model itself because compared to plasmodium, sometimes it is easier to make molecular biology and find first platform to go to the next uh, plasmodium. And sometimes you can compare them, sometimes not, but I think it's a very good model and an important chronic infectious disease that should not be neglected. Uh, that said, we also work on plasmodium, which is the, cause, the causing agent of malaria. Most of you know about that. Uh, the oopsie, the uh, 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 epicomplexa are obligate intracellular parasite. What does, that, what does that mean? It means that the parasite has to invade a host cell in order to divide, survive, and propagate. And uh, currently... So I'll show you just a quick movie whilst I'm talking. So you see in real time Toxoplasma gondii. So that's Toxoplasma in human cell and surrounding human cells here. You'll see in real time how it actually invades. So uh, uh, there are no human cells. So there's an active trigger. And here they're going into the human host cell in 10 seconds, even less. Here they'll have another one. And during this time, the parasite has already reprogrammed the host cell completely. Transcription factors stop apoptosis, reprogram metabolically everything, transcription at all levels. 
So it's a beast that actually not digesting us, but actually controlling us. Now, uh, for, uh, for uh, malaria and toxoplasmosis, actually there's no good efficient vaccine. I've seen an initiative here about a malaria vaccine. Uh, for now, that's the RTSS vaccine, but with five shots, we've seen with COVID that it might not be the best solution. So with the also the rapid emergence of, of uh, resistant parasite line all across the world, and here you have the map of the resistance of, an old map of the resistance of artemisinin, because now there's more cases, indigenous cases in India and in Africa. We need to study more these parasites in order to find new targets, understand their biology, their weakness links, and go to understand what they do. Now, one of the peculiarity of AP complexa parasite is that they harbor this uh, organelle that is a non-photosynthetic relic plastid, chloroplast, that is called the apicoplast. And this apicoplast, uh, as you may know, the chloroplast used to be a bacteria and it's been endosymbiotic, I um, mean, phagocytosed by an ancestral eukaryote cell. And this gave rise to all of the photosynthetic organism on Earth, all of the plants and stuff. At some point, the lineage here with different pigments, the red uh, lineage, uh, al unicellular algae, have been ph uh, phagocytosed by another ancestral eukaryote. And that gave rise to that phylum of organisms that are called apicomplexa. These apicomplexa have kept the plastid, lost photosynthetic activity, yet the plastid is essential, which makes it a plant Achilles heel into an animal parasite. And since we're not plants, it is an, an interesting avenue to, uh, to explore in order to find targets. Now, what is the link between uh, this plastid and the lipid and survival? So in general, lipids, uh, you hear about this boring molecule that are making uh, the walls of any cells. Basically, they're the structural components of all membranes but also they play important roles in signal transduction uh, by triggering new events. And in terms of apicomplexa, the discharge of the apical organelles that allow the parasite to enter the host cell is triggered by a signaling cascade that is uh, directed by lipids. And now a very hot topic at the time is also the role of lipids for storage in uh, bodies that are called lipid droplets. And these lipid droplets are becoming increasingly important in, 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 in a lot of diseases, including cancer, because they're the center, the center metabolic hub, also to trigger immune response, to trigger how the, uh, a cell can use energy or, the, or, or change, metabolically change, in order to respond to, um, to a stimuli or stress. For apicomplexa parasite, as I said, they're uh, obligate intracellular parasites and uh, they divide within the host cell. When they divide, meaning more membranes, meaning more lipids. When we discover the parasite, we thought, so that's a scheme showing here uh, the parasite and the outside. And we thought that the parasite were solely relying on the host cell to gulp and digest lipids and obtain these lipids from that. But the, in the early 90s, uh, uh, the, the apicoplast has been discovered and it changed the dogma because all plastid carry a prokaryotic type 2 fatty acid synthesis pathway. And for that, they're capable of making the building blocks of lipid that are fatty acid, the hydrophobic part of lipids. Uh, this fatty acid synthesis pathway depends on scavenging, taking the glucose from the host and within the parasites, uh, glycolysis occurs and the use of carbon and glycolysis is used to make fatty acids here. And these, oopsie, slide show how important the FAS2 pathway here. So here you have an image of uh, toxoplasma in red, the parasite, and in green, the plastid. And when they knocked out the FAS2 pathway, you can see the parasite's crumbling, not dividing anymore, and stop the block. Same thing in the malaria parasite. It is very essential during the liver stage and during the schizogony within the mosquito stages, so during intense divisional stages. And early studies uh, of the knockout of the FAST2 pathway showed that it was not essential in blood stage, but I would like to keep an ear open here on this because this dogma is not really real, and you will see why. In uh, plant chloroplasts, 
there is also a fatty acid synthesis pathway. And this fatty acid synthesis pathway fuel the synthesis of these lipids called galactolipids. The galactolipids make the envelope of chloroplast and allow photosynthesis. And you see here a knockout of the FAS2 pathway showing that it doesn't develop compared to other plants. It's white and chlorotic and dies. So that's the role of the FAS2 pathway. Initially, uh, we thought that it was also the case in, in uh, malaria. So we purified the apicoplast using magnetic beads um, uh, technology, and we looked at the lipid composition of that uh, plastid. So in plant chloroplast, it is very rich in galactolipids, and so it is in the closest photosynthetic uh, cousin of AP complexa parasite. But AP complexa, having lost the photosynthetic capacity, they've also shut down all of the synthetic pathway for making galactolipids and instead making phospholipid, which lay to the question, what is the role of FAST2? And a few years back, we found out that there was, similarly as in plant chloroplast, an acyl transferase. So basically, that's an enzyme that can take a fatty acid and graft it onto a backbone to make a precursor called lysophosphatidic acid, which is at the root of synthesis of any other lipids. So that brought the idea, theoretical idea that not only the parasite is capable of making building blocks of lipid, but also main precursors and not only relying on host cells. And our uh, studies showed that actually the parasite mixes two sources of lipid, the host lipid and its own fatty acid. And without this chimeric uh, lipids made of two sources, the parasite cannot grow. That leads us to this postulate at the moment where the team works. So both host lipids and apicoplast lipids are critical depending on the stage. And this patchwork is important for a parasite pro uh, propagation. And so we were wondering, what is, is, is there a host factor or something that tells the parasite, what should I use, when should I use it, and how do I mix it? So that was the first question that I'm going to be talking about. So is the pass to pathway always on or off? We wanted to know whether this pathway is always active or sharing this thing. So to do so, we've used mass spectrometry approach. And I won't go to too much details, but just a bit of basis. So that's a glucose, the parasite depends on glucose. And if we summarize what a glucose is, it's six carbons that we can uh, symbolize by the six balls. Here you do uh, a glycolysis and you uh, end up with acetyl-CoA, two carbon molecule. And the pass 2 pathway can use this acetyl-CoA and adding a two by two carbon by each cycle and create fatty acid. One of the fatty acid signature of the apicoplast is at 14 carbon molecule. And if you look at the atomic mass on the mass spectrometer, it's this mass. All right. Now, if you use stable isotopes, so you know that normal atoms exist, you know radioactive atoms. If I take the example of carbon, you have radioactive C14, which helps uh, to uh, date thing because it's unstable and breaks away. Now, in between the normal carbons and the radioactive carbon, you have stable isotope. As such, they're not radioactive, do not break, they do not generate any bad things, and they have a different mass. Hence, we can measure, quantify them by mass spectrometry. So if I take this, if we use a glucose that is fully labeled instead of normal carbon by C13 uh, carbons, then we can follow up the incorporation of each carbon and by a mass spectrometer. So here is unlabeled, here is labeled 256 minus 242 equals 14. So we can see the incorporation of each carbon by this approach and hence monitor the fatty acid synthesis this way. So it's a very clever way of seeing live what's going on in the pairs. Now we've used this technique to see what was going on in the parasite and whether the FAST2 pathway was active or not. All right, in your lab, in all labs, we like to culture the, 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 our organisms in the best conditions. You fuel them with full lipids, full proteins, full nutrients. Do you think this is physiological compared to a patient? No, this is not the reality. In some places, some people eat more. In some places, some people eat less. Hence, the, the availability of what you give to the parasite is different. So what you think when they've knocked it out, when they say, oh, yeah, it's not essential. Yeah, in my uh, perfect world in uh, vitro, when I fuel everything. Now, we've done that same, same thing in the rich medium. It was not active. We can't see the incorporation of carbons. Now, if you deprive it and you put yourself into a more physiological level of what's available to a real normal person, then you see the incorporation of carbon. What does that mean? It is very intuitive. That there is, it's not a binary thing, black or white. A gene is not essential or not. Take this idea off your head. 
It is more physiological. An organism is capable of sensing what's going on in the body and turn on and off and have a different metabolic program. So you need to have that in mind. So we took, again, the mutant. So in blue is the wild type growing in rich, medium, perfect. In, uh, in green here is the mutant that had been initially published in the good conditions of the lab. See, it survives. Now, if I look at the purple line here, if I put the FAST2 knockout into a physiological environment, it dies. Hence, the FAST2 pathway becomes essential when it is in scarce conditions. So what does that mean? And also it works in Toxo. What does that mean? That we can go maybe to more personalized medicine, thinking to know what is the status of the patient to use the right drug and use the right drugs against the right metabolism. What we saw as well during this condition, so here you have the parasite within its, its niche here, and here is the host cell. In a uh, uh, physiological condition with lipid deprived condition, we saw the accumulation of these giant multivesicular bodies that are accumulating around the niche of the parasite and the content is percolating towards the parasite. Long story short, we did a study here to show that this giant multivesicular body arose from the host organelle here, for example, from the nuclear envelope of the host by parasite effectors sent to the host cell. Brings me to this postulate here that's been generated by uh, a PhD student at the time, Suad, and our postdoc, Dr. Nikatris. Uh, in normal, rich condition, the parasite uh, relies more on the host cell to gulp as many things as possible and at a basal level to the FAST2 pathway. Then when you put it in physiological condition, there's an upregulation of the activity of the de novo synthesis for lipids, but also modifying the host cell so it provides more membrane material to the parasites. So there's different response in order to, in, in, in uh, physiological conditions to what's going on to the host. And our finding has also been uh, corroborated by other groups. The group of Mayamota also showed that if you if you feed the, the mice less, then they do less progeny in order to respond to the thing and being able to, to survive more. And an older paper of 2007 showed a transcriptomic analysis that the FAST2 pathway was really up into some patients from Africa that were malnourished. That was already a, sign, a, a hint at the time. And um, same thing, uh, the group of Matthias Marti showed that if you don't have the building blocks for lipids, the LPC, then the parasite turns convert into gametocytes, and gametocytes, a less dividing cell, and use less, uh, use less material, make less parasites, and go to sexual stages. Same thing in Toxo, it fills the environment and turns on and off the parasite. Now, as I said, so we have a FAST2 pathway that is depending on the, the physiological environment, an acyl transferase that brings the fatty acid from the, 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 uh, uh, the de novo synthesis and the mixing with the host lipid. But at the time, we're like, so what's going on there? By our knowledge, we know that phosphatidic acid is usually uh, uh, transformed into diethylglycerol by a phosphatase that takes off that phosphate group here. And that diacylglycerol is a versatile molecule that can lead to either membrane biogenesis, intense division, storing, or everything. So we thought at the time, how about looking at this? And we have the technology now. So this work is done on Toxo. And in Toxo, also in, in Plasmodium, there's been a whole genome CRISPR-Cas9 knockout. And we have now um, uh, scores of importance in rich conditions, mind you. Uh, and I'll come back to this. And we had the potential importance of the different phosphatidic acid phosphatase, and one of them called lipin had a very negative score, so it seemed to be very essential for the parasite. So we went on to studying it. And this was done by Serena and Sheena at the time. So they first localized the enzyme, and you see it's a perinuclear localization that is reminiscent of the endoplasmic reticulum. Then we made an inducible knockdown by uh, changing the promoter, uh, responding to anhydrotetracycline, and by adding the, the, the drug, then you shut down the expression of the gene. This is also seen by immunofluorescence, where uh, the localization and uh, the signal of uh, protein disappears. Now, replication, I say here, the numbers here uh, represent the number of parasites per vacuole. You see that in the mutant, we have uh, more small vacuoles and much less vacuole with many parasites and uh, an impressive number of what I call abnormal parasites. So we did 
plaque assay. So you may have heard of plaque assay during COVID. You put your pathogen onto a, a layer of host cell and where it degrades the host cell, you have white areas that can be quantified and statistically analyzed. So as I told you, all the parasite responds to the different uh, nutritional environment. And easy as to modulate this, you just have to modulate the complement that you add into your in vitro culture. Fetal bovine serum is a very good source of all nutrients, including lipids. So we change that. And usually at 10% and 1%, it grows very well. So usually, intuitively, the more nutrients you give, the better the parasite can grow. Here, if you look at our mutant of the lipin, it was completely counterintuitive. The more nutrient we give, the less that the, the, the parasite was growing. So there was a big question of... Why is that that we might give more nutrient the, the mutant doesn't grow? So we also look at the morphology of the parasite, and you can see that already at zero percent, you have like usually it's a very nice crescent shape. There's no bump on the side, and here you see you have evagination all going on. The more you increase the level of nutrient, then you have too much membrane going on, and at the end, the parasite is unable to do anything. It's sclerotic and dies. So what happened at the lipid level? So we looked at the different lipid classes. Here, PL means phospholipid, so structural membrane. DAG is this versatile molecule that's in between the two. Free fatty acids, as I said, is, uh, are the building blocks of lipids. And finally, triacylglycerol, which is the species of lipids that is basically a resource of storage. And so a lipid with three legs, fatty acids that are used at any time. So what we could see here is the significant reduction of triacylglycerol. And these triacylglycerol are usually found in lipid bodies. So we looked at the, uh, the presence of lipid bodies. You see normal parasite, 10%, you have plenty of lipid bodies, whereas you have some at 1%. And in the mutant, these lipid droplets were actually uh, um, um, significantly reduced. And what we could see over time also is that in this mutant, we could see the gradual increase of free fatty acids accumulating in the parasites. So there was something going on wrong. To see what was this increase or, or this lipid going on, we needed to know what is the source of this lipid. And this is where Yoshiki, Serena, and Sheena came up with these new approaches. So I already quickly told you about how to use glucose to monitor the fast 2 pathway. So you use glu label glucose when the parasite is within the host cell and you let it grow and you see the synthesis of, li of lipids by the apicoplast. To see what was coming out from the host cell, uh, uh, Yoshiki and uh, Shina came up with this idea of taking an empty host cell, pre-labeling it with glucose. So the host cell used the glucose to make its own lipids. So all lipids of the host cell are labeled. And you wash it away, put the parasite in, let it grow, take the parasite. And then if any lipid is labeled in the parasite, it has to come from the host cell. Hence, we have a technique to monitor scavenging. And we have another third technique because the parasite is also capable of taking from the external environment of the host cell. So in this case, we put deuterated fatty acids into the external medium uh, during the development. And if you see this label lipids within the parasite, has to come from the external media. So now we were able to track any source of lipid and monitor that. So we first looked at what was the uh, uh, input of the FAST2 pathway. And here uh, in, the, in the mutant, we didn't see the accumulation of free fatty acid as expected from the, uh, the epicoplast. So the answer is not coming from the epicoplast. Same thing with the external environment. We see a reduction of these label lipids within the mutant. So it's not coming from the external environment. You see me coming. When we label the host cell here, we see that famous increase of fatty acids come from the host cell, and we see that lacking in the triacylglycerol. Hence, the lipids that are accumulating in the mutant are coming from the host cell. That leads us to this postulate. In normal conditions, the parasite, and it works the same, you'll see in malaria. In normal conditions, the parasite constantly gulps the lipids from the host cell. And it uses the lipin to actually uh, combine it with the fatty acid from the, uh, from the fast tube, but make lots of storage lipids, arrow here, and a little bit for membrane biogenesis. In our mutants, we see that we have a phenotype of malform parasite and, and toxicity. So without the lipin, the parasite cannot use this fatty acid from the host 
I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, they cannot use the, the fatty acids from the host and incorporate them into storage. The parasite constantly think, oh, I'm out of lipids, so I'm going to be more and more and more. And in this case, it says also, well, let's stop the new de de novo synthesis. And instead, there's lipids accumulating. They don't go to the lipid storage because the, the enzyme is not there. But instead, it tries to use it. And eventually, it dies of obesity. Can't use it proper. So that leads us to this. So there is a um, host origin goes to storage. There is apicoplast origin, and depending on, on uh, nutritional status, then you have uh, the making coming up. How is the parasite mixing? That was my last uh, question. I don't know whether I have a lot of time. I want you to see this that we've done. So there are screens going on uh, at the level of a whole genome, and the initial screen was done at 10%. We redid the screen in physiological conditions and tracked all of the uh, uh, all of the proteins present in the parasite. So you see in orange, it's 10%, and in blue, it's physiological conditions. You see that you have more enzyme in the negative score. So in this, you have more enzyme becoming more essential. And I want you to pay attention to this particular enzyme here, math. It's not essential in your rich conditions, yet at 1% becomes the most essential protein. What does that mean? that the parasite puts on a metabolic program depending on the conditions and what you believe it are at a, 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 a one-time point on one condition doesn't work in other conditions. Keep that in mind always. So uh, from this, we've identified different types of enzyme. Uh, um, I'll just do two minutes on this because it's the common finding with uh, with ACIF. One of the enzymes that uh, we found was uh, lysophospholipase. So phospholipase are basically enzymes that can cut fatty acids from an existing lipid to make it available. This is the landscape of phospholipases and lysophospholipases in, in, in uh, plasmodium. You see there's a lot. And just for your attention, for those in malaria, they're encoded in the subtelomeric region where the VAR genes and the duplications of, of surface antigens are going on. These are the only metabolic genes present in there. So it means that the parasite must have a use to increase the family of these enzymes constantly. Very essential. That's a little bracket. We uh, had a uh, focus on this one enzyme here, localized it, and we find it in the uh, interface between the host cell and the parasite. When we knock it out, we have less progeny than a normal parasite. And the parasite is incapable of transitioning from uh, the trophozoid to the, uh, the schizon stage, meaning the stage that gives progenies. We did lipidomic analysis. We saw that triacylglycerol was down, that phospholipid were up, that uh, uh, storage lipids were down and free fatty acid were up. It was reminiscent of the lipin story, accumulation of toxic lipids. We saw that also by using fluorescent lipid in normal condition, the, uh, the uh, one of the lysolipid that is used by the enzyme accumulates within the parasite, not too much. And in the mutant, it stays outside, can't be used. So it was corroborating our lipidomic analysis. And long story short, so, uh, here as the enzyme, with if you block the enzyme, there's no more fatty acids available towards storage and used during schizogony. And the parasite accumulates fatty acid again to a, a lipotoxic level and dies of it because it can't mobilize it properly. So same thing as in toxo, the parasite need to gobs, store, mobilize at key points during schizogony. Good thing, and this is very important for today, we have found inhibitors of this particular enzyme, uh, LPL4, two components from the MMV. Uh, I don't know why I don't have the MMV logo here, uh, but uh, these are drugs ex existing that we recycled and reused, and they actually block the enzyme, have the same phenotype at the lipid level, at the, uh, at the physiological level, all requested by reviewers. We knew it, but we made it possible. And these drugs are actually quite good targets that could be used to shut down and kill the parasite at a key point, maybe in combination or not, we're at this stage of development. Uh, I'll just dun, 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 skip because I'm already out of time. I wanted to show you something about a transporter of the Epicoplus, but uh, let's say I'm going to leave time for others. Uh, I would like 
to thank all uh, the people in our team, especially Suad, Sheena, Melanie, Serena, uh, Christoph, and Nick, who, and of, of course, your skills at the head of everything there uh, for this finding. Uh, this was done clearly in collaboration with you, Asif and Pawan. So thank you so much. And I hope we're going to do more science. I'm not hoping, I know. Uh, I also thank Jan, who's done a tremendous job for a phylogeny I didn't have time to show you. And Jeroen Sage, who we've done the CRISPR-Cas9 screens in physiological conditions. Um, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'll take some questions if I have to take some questions. Thank you very much. Questions for Parasite? Uh, we have a list of lipids which Parasite takes from both and which its size is. You know, why I'm asking this question uh, a few years back, we actually, when we growing Parasite in the culture, we took the soup uh, at different time marks and we tried to measure what are the lipids which are getting depleted mm -hmm. and uh, which are the which uh, the lipids which are being secreted, yes. yep. which are going up in the soup and which are going down. And we found around two to three, four changes some of the lipids. Mm -hmm. Why we were doing is that we want to know what is the transporter or what is the protein which is pushing lipids from uh, human host or human blood into the parasite and can we really, if we know that which is transporter or adopter, we can develop methodology to starve the parasite. Really? Not our aim. So we were able to find some, some uh, lipids like this and uh, but we still have to repeat this two, three times more. That's phosphatidyl choline or phosphatidyl serine as well as sphingolipids. But we, do we have any idea now, since you have, you all are working on that, which are parasite is taking from post and which is, uh, so which is inside? One key thing is, as you mentioned, choline, phosphocholine, lysophosphatidylcholine, and phosphatidylcholine, so the whole family. So phosphatidylcholine is the major lipid class that you find in most eukaryotes. Because it's a versatile molecule, you can have the fatty acid from it, you can have the glycerol backbone, and you can go back to neoglucogenesis from it, and you can use the choline to make new phosphatidylcholine from your own lipids in the parasite. So clearly, uh, PC, at least in plasmodium, is a key thing. But another thing, because it's not so crucial. But what Matthias Marty showed is that if you don't have LPC, then the parasite goes into cytogenesis. He kind of forgot some of the early Japanese studies in the early 2000s where they showed that actually the mini soup, minimal soup required for the parasite to survive is oleic acid, C18-1, and palmitic acid, C16-0. These are the only ones. Just with that, you keep the parasite okay. Now the parasite is much more clever than that. I need more, I take more. I'll store, I'll use later. So it can take vesicle. It, so there's probably massive transporter through the PV. It cuts lipids at the site of the PV, as we see with the LPL. It cuts from Mike Blackman the polar head. So they are transporter probably for the choline, a transporter for the fatty acids. We can think that maybe fatty acids could transition directly through the, the, the membrane, although I don't think this is possible. There's also, we talked about it yesterday, activator of fatty acid, acyl coa synthetase, and you know this family is huge in, in plasmodium, encoded in the subtilomeric region. So another thing, probably there is something that is, um, so if I can show you quickly that, Tech, tech, tech. We have so lipid transporters here. So these are P-type P ATPase on the left. You have transporters for ions. You have transporters for lipids. P-type, P4-type ATPase are flipases. You may have heard of that. Now, there's another group, oops, that's called P5 ATPase with non-canonical substrate. We just found out that this P5 ATPase is actually the exporter of fatty acids in the apicoplast. And I'm looking at you because you may be interested into this. This current uh, data is in revision at the moment, but we're clearly um, um, we're sure that this is the thing. And this is absent from all of the other photosynthetic organisms. It's something epicomplex and peculiar. 
So another class of enzyme, the, the, the transport other things have been reused to transport uh, these things. And this is from a screen. Other groups are founded by doing a, a bio ID, turbo ID with the actual known transporter of the EpicoPlus because we only had one until now, the TPT or the AP transporter. They've used a, a proximity and found these things. So at the PV, how about using one major transporter, do turbo ID, and then try to do a proteomic analysis on this. But I'm not inventing the world. You're better than this. You're better at this than me. So, uh, Cyril, uh, I'm trying to digest the hypothesis of access fact versus less. And as, as was a heartbreaker for all the, the drug industry, when the fast you knock out, survive, and was not some place. Uh, sure. And you do agree with the definition of speciality, but it was turned around when you happened when you when you did the knockout in Plasmodium burgia. I'm trying to think of David Fedek's paper and so on. There, it is essential in blood stages, right? They are in, essential in liver. They are essential. So liver, liver, they are essential clearly. They are okay. essential in mosquito, and it becomes critical in answering to what's outside, inside during blood stages. Yeah, yeah. So my point is that why why is such differences uh, in blood stages versus the uh, the liver stages. Obviously, the host is playing a role, and clearly, um, it is not able to import fatty acids from from the host. In the case of the yeah, liver, actually, the liver cell is liver cell. only one capable of massive yeah, exactly. fatty acid synthesis. Yeah, exactly. Why is that? That you need to make it in so, a role? So, since I mean, it's just doing mathematical analysis. The only thing missing out is an active host. The case of blood stages. So clearly, when the parasite does not have the the machinery to get the host lipids, somehow it is finding a way. I mean, almost getting philosophical uh, 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 to get it uh, from the host, isn't it? I mean, it just spikes up the pathway, and then of course uh, these fatty acids are uh, transported, and then just difference in yeah, yeah. expression yeah. of uh, transport. So, well, the I, don't, I don't think that is as, as simple as simple. So there's several things. There's a feedback loop probably going on, and we've seen in plants that astil astillation can feel and and, uh, and it can can do it. But also, I think there's a massive sensor. There's a there's a there's a molecular switch to change the program and upregulate this, uh, the, the 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 expression of these enzymes. We talked about it yesterday. Well, we looked for uh, the mTOR pathway. Which is like responding for uh, uh, deprivation and everything. Uh, we have an actor of it because most of the mTOR pathway is missing in uh, in the parasite, but there is a little thing. Yep, sorry. DHE, you can also get it from hydrolysis of it too. Clearly. Yeah, but then does it just PIPLC also play a role in that in the process? Uh, inside, yes. So these lipids are getting recycled to provide, and it comes to the question of uh, one, some existing lipids are transformed. So uh, in minute amounts, the parasite is just making use of it to retransform them into, into a structural membrane makers. Okay, quick questions from Dr. Wang. No, I'm not. I thought you have a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question from Dr. Okay, yes. So, uh, so when you just think about the epicoplast, you know, this although we know it's a good target, and it's like you know, but there is all this delayed death phenomenon. So this has been typically one criticism that you know it can't be a good drug because so with respect to the slippage story, so I think in plasmodium people have shown already that you could rescue. Epicoplast loss by I think no, we can talk about it because it's not real. It's not really. Oh, no. Well, Sean Prick showed it last year. There's many epicoplast vesicles where the uh, metabolic activities are held. It's just a mirage of not having the epicoplast. <laughs> this lipid story also. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the epicoplast vesicles, which are... We don't see them. I think the thing is that you don't see them. The only way to see them, and we, we thought about it with Yashiki, is to do metabolic uh, labeling and see the actual metabolic activity once the plast is not out. Exactly. So, having, but uh, having, it was not the ratio. Have done the lipid labeling? You see that in labeling studies in in apical plus minus. Where there is like a no segregation effect or like parasites. It's uh, going on now. <laughs> <laughs> but again, for uh, the drug thing and the slow acting drug, we need.
combination of drugs. So a fast acting drug such as artemisinin or something like that, and something that acts on a secondary level. So that's the combination of things that will, because you have a reservoir of parasites sticking in your body. And if some of them are responding differently to the condition, so basically you kill them, hammer them with artemisinin or something, and then you've got a population that's just like sticking out and like being able to survive and create a new population there, you need to get rid of those. That's why you need to understand what's the real biology of the parasite and not thinking binary, but thinking, oh yeah, that's not essential, let's forget about. Long live India and France friendship.